Uh, today, our guest is a Professor Sardar Yüksel. He received his bachelor's degree in electrical and electronics engineering from Bilkent in 2001. He received his master's and PhD uh, from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in electrical and computer engineering. He was a postdoc at Yale University, and now he is an assistant professor at Queen's University in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. Also, he has an adjunct appointment at Bilkent University. His research interests are stochastic control theory, information theory, and probability theory. Today, he will give us a talk about stochastic control with partial information. And thank you for accepting our invitation. Now, the floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you very much, Saliha, and thanks very much for the organizing committee. Uh, I came to know about the directed reading program some time ago from uh, uh, our, some of our graduate students and also some of our former colleagues. And uh, I know it's a wonderful, very, very good and, and much needed initiative for uh, the development of future mathematicians in Turkey. So, uh, and I'm very happy to be able to contribute to this initiative, to this seminar. Just a minor correction, Sadia. Uh, I, I'm a professor uh, in uh, mathematics and statistics at Queen's. I've been at Queen's for some time now. So the, the title of the talk is uh, uh, very much self-descriptive, but it's always difficult to give a seminar of this type because you don't know who the audience is and you, you don't know uh, uh, who uh, knows what uh, background. And often it's very uh, uh, it's a very delicate balance to try to uh, give a too basic of a seminar or too technical of a seminar. And uh, and sometimes uh, what I have come to uh, uh, decide for such seminars is that I try to give a, a presentation which is of tutorial type, hopefully accessible to a, a general mathematics graduate student or beginning graduate student. But then towards the end, the material may not be as accessible, but the idea is that uh, the student will be able to see what type of mathematics, what type of ideas are are, uh, are uh, basically the primary language for uh, problems of this type. So I hope that that uh, strategy may be beneficial uh, for uh, for the uh, for the participants. And what I'll be presenting is, is joint work with some of uh, my former students. Uh, uh, Ali uh, uh, got his PhD at Queens a few years ago. He was a postdoc in Michigan, and now he's a professor at Florida State University in mathematics. Emre is a currently a PhD student uh, student at Queens, and now uh, finishing his PhD at Yale University. And and, and now this is now a professor at Bilkent University in mathematics. So control Markov models, uh, so we start with an equation, a general equation, xt plus one equals f of xt, ut, wt. xt is a state variable, ut is a control action variable, wt is what we call a, a stochastic noise. And uh, in this case, we assume that the spaces are uh, basically uh, uncountable spaces, but uh, nice uncountable spaces. Basically, these are spaces that we call uh, standard Borel spaces. Uh, basically, this uh, primarily include complete separable metric spaces. But for the sake of this presentation, you can think of them as uh, finite dimensional vector space, real space, uh, or a, a, a finite or countable space. Because the concepts are, are, I think, what is very important here. The technicality just comes uh, uh, very mechanically once you understand the main ideas behind the, 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 behind the theory. Now, we call this a controlled Markov model because of the following. If you have an equation which satisfies this uh, dynamical uh, recursion, then uh, if the ut and xt process is x cross u to the power uh, z plus, make it is a, the, the product space involving uh, the state and action sequences uh, indexed by non-negative integers. And if this process satisfies the following conditional probability, this means that the state at the next uh, state at time t plus one being in some set B, given the history, is the same as the conditional probability of the next state being in B, given the current state and current action. So it's in a sense, in the if you've seen uh, what a, a Markov chain is or what a Markov process is, it's like the controlled version of this. You just condition on the U also. That's why we call this a, a controlled Markov chain. So, uh, so it seems that the lower part is not visible here. Maybe I should just try to use this as needed. Okay. Now the selection you see in, in the previous in the previous slide, uh, we have xt plus one, this next state, 
the current state, the current action, and the noise process, right? Now, the selection of UT, that is the main problem in uh, stochastic control theory. How do you select the UT? And often the selection of UT is, uh, is given, is provided by what we call a control policy or control law. Okay, control policy maps what is available to the decision maker or the controller to what the controller can do. And we often categorize this in the context of the problems I've discussed so far in the following three uh, sets. The set of admissible policies, in this case, at every time t, you can use the entire past history of the states and the entire past history of the actions to select the current action at time t. If instead of the entire past, you only focus on the current state and the current time, then we call this a Markov policy. And if in this setup, all the gamma t's are identical, which means that gamma t is a time invariant map from the state to actions, we call this a stationary policy. And the controller essentially selects the action with some criteria in mind, with some criterion in mind. This may be an optimization criterion, stabilization criterion, or other criterion such, for example, robustness or uh, some performance guarantees. And some popular criteria are the following. You may want to minimize a cost up to a finite uh, index and try to minimize this expression where C sub n is some terminal cost. You can try to minimize an infinite horizon cost problem. Uh, in this case, beta is some uh, what you call a discount parameter, which means that the cost of the future time stages are less important than the cost in the near uh, time uh, uh, values, near, near time horizon. And the counterpart of the discount cost criterion is what we call the average cost criterion. In this case, what happens is what is important is the uh, distant or the ergodic uh, realization of the costs. In particular, the short term or the transient costs are not important. So these three provide a very rich class of uh, rich set of criteria, which are very uh, uh, applicable for many problems in uh, many applied sciences, engineering sciences, applied mathematics. And I'll give some examples shortly. And other criteria include, for example, risk sensitive cost criteria, cost up to an exit time, sample path cost criteria, and various forms of uh, stability. For example, you can say, can I make my system stable by some uh, controlled uh, uh, closed loop dynamics? And uh, this again will uh, often uh, entail several uh, forms of stochastic stability criteria. For example, you can say, I want there to be an invariant probability measure. I want my process to be what we call positive Harris recurrent. We want our process to be in such a way that as time goes to infinity, the moments of the state realization, the state variable uh, should be finite. So there are lots of refinements for, uh, for uh, the criteria of this type. And we call uh, problems of this type a Markov decision process. So make it the problem of having a control Markov problem uh, as given earlier, and the question of finding the right action, right uh, policy to, uh, for mapping what we know to what we can do is called a Markov decision process. And so because, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, because I don't know who knows what background information, I just want to give some general high-level examples so that you can see what types of problems uh, one studies, uh, one covers with uh, this theory. And towards the end, I'll be discussing more specific, uh, uh, more technical material, with the goal being both to, in a way, deliver some information, but also to show the types of mathematics that we need for problems of this type. So one very important example is the optimal linear control problem. In this case, you have a linear system, uh, xt plus minus axt plus but plus wt. And in this case, uh, we want to minimize what we call a quadratic cost minimization. So Q is a, a positive semi-definite matrix, R is a positive definite matrix. You want to minimize this expectation over all possible policies. So this is a very important problem, very classical problem, and it arises in many, many engineering applications, as well as in uh, applications in applied mathematics and economics. And for example, one special case of this is, is the tracking problem. Suppose you are trying to uh, uh, find a, an optimal path that a robot can take, and you want the robot to follow a given path. And in this case, you embed the dynamics of the uh, robot and the dynamics of the reference path into A by a superstate. And then you define the cost function to be in such a way that the cost function penalizes the deviation from the uh, uh, reference path uh, uh, of the actual path. And an example is from uh, com computer networks. For example, suppose you have a, a, a network and a, an incoming traffic arrives, and then the router routes the incoming traffic to two stations. And the job of the uh, router is to assign which substation to be processing the incoming traffic. Or you can think of this as a, an operations research problem where you have a manager and the manager receives 
tasks and the manager has two, let's say, two secretaries and the manager assigns the incoming uh, assignment to the different secretaries. So anyway, it's a very rich model and you can make it as complex as possible by in including substations and substations, but the essence of the ideas are the same. The idea is that you want to be able to map the incoming traffic to different uh, servers. For example, in this case, if the incoming traffic is an independent Bernoulli process and you want to set uh, the action to be either to assign the incoming traffic to station one or to station two, then you write down the evolution for the first station and the second station where L1 is the workload in the first station, L2 is the workload in the second station. And you want to ask the question, what are the conditions for the system to be stable? Or, uh, and in terms of the, uh, uh, for example, uh, incoming traffic rate uh, and the service rate at the both stations. And you want to say, I want to make sure that on average, I have a finite number of uh, customers as opposed to an uh, a queue where the number of customers goes off to infinity, in, in which case the system is said to be unstable. And you can also try to optimize the system, not just stabilize it. In this case, you can make it as complex as you want. As I mentioned, for example, you can the incoming traffic can be, uh, instead of a Bernoulli process in the previous uh, uh, example, suppose it's a Poisson process. Uh, in this case, uh, if the service rate is what we call an exponential uh, service rate, then it turns out that this is an equivalent uh, representation in discrete time with the following model. And you ask the question, I want to minimize, not only optimize, not only stabilize the system, but I also want to optimize the system in the following sense. I want to minimize the, the cost of the length of each station. I can use an example from uh, both computer networks as well as operations research. You can think of a, another example, which is again very popular in uh, in, especially in uh, industrial engineering and also in business schools, you talk about inventory production system. Suppose you are producing, let's say, vehicles, producing cars, for example, at, a, at an automobile factory, and X is the number of uh, uh, vehicles in your inventory, uh, and UT is the production at a given time stage, and WT is the stochastic demand, how many cars are being sold at, a, at any given time. And in this case, you try to say, okay, I want to minimize the uh, cost of production, I have a cost of storage, and I also want to make sure, make sure that I can uh, sell the, the, the uh, inventory and I can try to hopefully make some income and you try to, in a way, uh, minimize the cost. Mathematical finance is a very important application. Uh, in this case, uh, a typical example is what people call a, a, an asset allocation problem. Suppose that you have two uh, possible uh, assets. You have a stock market and you have a... a a guaranteed uh, a, a bond market. And in this case, suppose that uh, an investor has XT, uh, uh, XT dollars. And what the investor can do is, the investor can either invest in a stochastic market, where in this case, sigma sub t is a stochastic return, or you can, the investor can invest in a deterministic market, where in this case, there's a fixed uh, return. And you want to, for example, as a common uh, reward to optimize, you may want to maximize your, uh, the logarithm of your wealth at a terminal time. And in this case, with some mathematics, you can show that this is equal to the maximization of this expression. It's just an, as an example. Uh, just want to give the general flavor of the uh, applications. Or we can apply uh, the ideas to a completely different field, which we call information theory. In this case, suppose that you have a Markov process and you want to transmit this Markov process over a communication channel to a receiver in real time. And you want to minimize the distortion end-to-end. -end. Suppose that you are watching a Champions League game uh, over the Atlantic Ocean, and you have a camera which maps the game, and then it sends the data across the Atlantic Ocean, and at the receiver, you are trying to recover the live game with as low distortion as possible. In this case, you have an encoder policy which maps what has happened in, in, up to time t, and then you have a decoder policy, and the decoder maps what you have received at time t to uh, the reconstruction, and you want to minimize some uh, distortion criterion between the actual process. Jean, may I ask you a question? Yes, please. Jean, for example, maybe I didn't get it, but what is the main difference? I mean, between the Poison and the Bernoulli. I mean, right. So for the, Bernoulli, slice. for the Bernoulli process, uh, thank you for for the question. So for the Bernoulli process, uh, the process is zero one valued. In the Bernoulli process, for example, you, uh, AT can either be zero or one. So if you are zero, let's say with probability one minus lambda, you are one with probability uh, uh, lambda, right? So a, a Bernoulli process is a stochastic process where each realization is either zero or one. A Poisson process, however, 
you take the values on any non-negative integer. And in this case, the probability of at equals m is equal to e to the minus lambda times lambda to the power m over m factorials. So the difference is that the Poisson process, you can take any integer, non-negative integer, including zero, whereas for a Bernoulli process, you either are zero or one. Thank you, teacher. So the point of making these examples is to show how rich the, the, the uh, application areas are. Because you can apply uh, the theory, uh, the same theory, to so many different areas. And uh, as I note here at the, at the bottom, there are many other application areas in, in natural sciences, in applied sciences, in health sciences, in economics, where uh, this uh, type of problems uh, are, are applicable. Especially when you consider what we call partial observable models and also multi-agent models which requires a slight uh, deviation from what I've discussed so far, but the essence of the ideas are, uh, 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 is really the same. It's really going to be uh, uh, conceptually the same with technical uh, uh, additions or extensions. And towards the end of my presentation, I'll also talk about continuous time uh, problems very briefly. And again, with the same philosophy in mind. Once you understand the basic setup with the essence, uh, essential uh, uh, results on the structure of the optimal policy, the types of course criteria, the generalization is really technical. So now to understand problems of this type, uh, and also to try to give you the flavor of the mathematics that uh, we are uh, engaged in to study such problems, I'll give a, 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 some uh, supporting theory for solving such problems. And the essence theory, the essential theory is basically a probability theory. And for probability theory, uh, uh, in the context of stochastic control, we have to understand the properties of the space of probability measures. Now, for probability measures, uh, the uh, first ingredient is to try to understand what it means for a sequence of probability measures to converge to another one. And this will let us define a metric, uh, if we can, on the space of probability measures. In this context, uh, we say that a sequence of probability measures mu n on a, a measurable space x and with the Borel sigma algebra on the uh, on the space x converges to another uh, probability measure mu if uh, the following hold. We say mu n goes to mu weekly if the integration g d mu n goes to g d mu for every bounded and continuous g. And you can find a, a various equivalent. Uh, the descriptions or characterizations of this convergence notion, but in the interest of time, I'll just give this more standard uh, definition. So anyway, what you want is you want this uh, expectation of G under the measure mu n to go to the expectation of G under the measure mu for every fixed bounded and continuous function G. If you generalize this result from bounded continuous G to bounded measurable G, or equivalently, if you say that mu n of b goes to mu of b for every Borel set b in the space x, then we say that mu n goes to mu setwise. And we say that mu n goes to mu in total variation if this setwise convergence is uniform over all b, or if this uh, integral convergence is uniform over all bounded functions g, bounded measurable functions g. And finally, a, a, a very important uh, intermediate uh, condition is what we call the Wasserstein uh, convergence. In this case, you take the supremum over, not just uh, uh, continuous, not just continuous, uh, sorry, measurable bounded functions, uh, but here you uh, restrict the family of functions over which we are maximizing this distance to be those which are Lipschitz. In particular, the, uh, the Lipschitz norm of the functions g over which we are maximizing this integral difference is going to be uh, called the uh, Wasserstein distance, and mu n goes to mu in the one Wasserstein distance if this uh, expression goes to zero. So these are uh, four very important uh, uh, characterizations for convergence of probability measures, and they imply very different uh, spaces. Because the set of probability measures is a set, a given set, but on this set, once you define a convergence notion, or once you define a distance, then you obtain very different properties. For example, under weak convergence, the set of probability measures becomes what you call a complete separable metric space. Whereas under self-wise convergence, this uh, space is not metrizable. Under total variation, this space is uh, is uh, metric, but is not separable. So in a way, it's remarkable that uh, once you define different notions, you obtain very different behaviors. 
Now, in the context of our, the, our uh, general discussion at the very beginning of the uh, of, of the presentation, uh, I'll give now several examples for each of the criteria, and we'll obtain some corresponding implications of the uh, of, of the regularity criteria. So uh, the first assumption is what I'll call assumption S. In this case, we say that the transition probability is uh, setwise continuous in U if uh, the conditional probability of the next state. So remember, this T is from the very first slide. It's the conditional probability of the next state given the current state and current action. So if U n goes to U, then the conditional probability will convert setwise in uh, uh, for every fixed uh, for every fixed x. And we assume that C is bounded and measurable, and it's continuous uh, for every fixed x on U. So as an example, if my model is given in this form, if I take f to be continuous in u for every fixed x, and if w admits a density, for example, if wk is a, such as a, a, a Gaussian random variable, Gaussian independent random variable, and if the density function is continuous, then this uh, conditional probability measure uh, induced by this dynamics satisfies uh, this assumption A. The second assumption is what we call the, the weak feather continuity. In this case, we say that the stochastic kernel is weakly continuous if, so this uh, z should be x. If whenever x and u n goes to x u, so you have joint continuity, then uh, the conditional probability tau will go to the conditional probability of uh, tau x u uh, weakly. And we also impose that the cost function is continuous and bounded. As an example, if my model is given in this equation, and if for every fixed w, f is a continuous function, jointly continuous function in x and u, then we say that uh, this uh, kernel, a weakly continuous kernel, or a weak failure kernel. In fact, many examples in practice satisfy this condition. And if you have further structure, then you can also have the Wasserstein regularity. In this case, uh, let me give an example first. So in this case, if your example is given by um, f of x t u t w t, and if for every uh, w, we have this deviation, like this is the upper bound, so f of x n u n minus f of x u is upper bound by alpha times x n minus x plus u n minus u absolute value, then the kernel is uh, what you call Wasserstein continuous. And in this case, uh, uh, the regularity condition we are after is the following. For every fixed x u and y u, the difference between the conditional probability when the state is at x and when the state is at y is upper bounded by the distance between x and y multiplied by a constant, k2. And we also re obtain some uh, required condition on our cost function. In this case, for every fixed u, c of x u minus c of y u is upper bounded by k times d of x y. Anyway, we have a Lipschitz continuity condition, uniform in, in, in uh, the action variables. So, so then what we did basically so far is that we gave three examples, three types of problems, where in one, the kernel is setwise continuous in actions. In the other one, the kernel is weakly continuous in set action pairs. In the other one, we have a Wasserstein regularity in the state uh, pair, in the state for every given action. Now, given this now, and in view of the applications I gave earlier, how do we solve such problems? So it's, uh, remember, uh, this was our finite horizon cost problem. So the way to solve this problem is what we call backwards induction or dynamic programming. In this case, what you do is you go backwards in time, you first declare a terminal cost uh, function and the terminal cost is going to be your value at the very last state. And then you go backwards in time. You set jn equals cn. And then you go backwards in time. And you say jt of x is equal to minimum of u, given current uh, cost and the future cost values. And you solve this inductively. And then once you are able to obtain this recursive uh, uh, set of uh, value functions, as well as control policies, then gamma star so when you minimize this, suppose that this minimization is attained by ft of xt for every time stage, then we say that the control policy gamma star is optimal, and optimal cost is equal to j star of x. To make it, when you go backwards in time, the limiting value j sub 0 of x is going to be your optimal, optimal cost. And so this is a, basically a condition for, uh, in, a, in a way, a, a sufficiency condition. And here we also show that, uh, in fact, uh, you can guarantee that such a condition exists. You can guarantee that such a solution exists. In particular, if your action set is uh, compact, action space is compact, then under the S assumption or WF assumption or WSA assumption, under each of these assumptions, there's an optimal policy. Furthermore, when you have the weak continuity condition, 
the value function j t is continuous. Under assumption w a, it is Lipschitz continuous. And under s, it is measurable. Now, the implication is that once we have continuity and Lipschitz continuity, this invites us to apply approximation uh, ideas, and which is going to be very important. Because when your space is uncountable, we have to always have approximation. We have to obtain numerical methods also. But nonetheless, if the goal is just to have an existence and uniqueness type result, then any of these conditions is sufficient. Now, for the discount cost problem, because again, this is again part of the tutorial type of the, this presentation. If you have a discount cost problem, uh, in this case, as you remember, beta is a discount parameter, and you are trying to minimize an infantilizing cost, cost problem, and then you try to minimize this expression. Uh, in this case, the optimal solution is characterized by what we call the discounted cost optimality equation given by this expression. And in this case, for every v, we define an operator. So t maps v to t of v. In particular, if v is in the space of continuous bounded functions under assumption wf, then tv maps continuous functions to continuous functions. Under assumption uh, s, it maps bounded measurable functions to bounded measurable functions. And furthermore, it is what we call a contraction, a contraction map. And by uh, Banach's fixed point theorem, then uh, there exists a fixed point equation. And then you can conclude that uh, under WF, V is continuous, under SS, it is bounded, and under the Wasserstein regularity, provided that this condition applies, then uh, the value function is going to be Lipschitz. And finally, for the average cost problem, again, in this case, you rec recall that you're trying to minimize the average cost over the ergodic uh, limit. There are three techniques uh, which are often used in practice. Uh, one is what we call the value iteration technique. The other is what we call the vanishing discount technique. In this case, what you do is you pretend that there is a beta here, and then you set beta to 1. You take the limit as beta goes to 1, and you multiply on the left by 1 minus beta. And by some mathematical uh, uh, arguments, you are trying to uh, imitate the theory to arrive at this equation. Anyway, you perturb the discount cost optimality equation to arrive at the average cost optimality equation. And finally, a very rich uh, technique is what we call the commercial analytic method. In this case, instead of applying contraction-based techniques, you obtain uh, the behavior, you study the behavior of the empirical uh, occupation measures, and then you show that every empirical occupation measure which converges will converge to a, a set of invariant measures which satisfy a balance equation. And that uh, reduces the search space, which leads to a compact convex space of probability measures, and then you can optimize the problem as a linear program. Now, the first two techniques often require what they call minorization conditions. But uh, we can also obtain a condition using Wasserstein continuity. And these are going to be important for what I'm to present in the context of partial observable models. Now, so, so far, I, what I did is I tried to give a very high-level discussion. And I, it was, uh, again, uh, a lot of material so far. But uh, the idea was to, in a way, give the essence of Markov decision process, processes. These are processes where you have a state, you have an action, you want to find the optimal action for every given time stage, and you want to minimize uh, a number of uh, possible uh, uh, cost, criteria, cost criteria you want to consider. And then for them, you obtain some uh, approaches, optimality conditions, as well as the conditions which guarantees that an optimal solution exists, as well as the regularity properties of the optimal cost values. But in today's theme, my main uh, goal will be to talk about partial observable models. In this case, you do not see the state x. You only see a function of the state, a stochastic function or, or, or a, a noisy perturbed value of the state. So in this case, let me give the more con concrete example. So we have our state evolution is given as before, and we have a measurement function available to us. And in this case, the stochastic flow is given by the following. So you, you look at the joint uh, distribution of the x0 and y0. X0 is given by your prior, and then you have a measurement kernel, which maps X0 to the measurements. And as time proceeds, for every given past history, you have the condition probability from the state to measurement and the state action pairs to the next state. So T is as before, our stochastic kernel. The difference here is that now we also have a Q, a measurement channel. And let me give a pictorial description of this. So in this case, you have a, your state X, there's a measurement channel, and this channel maps Q to your measurement output Y, and then the decision maker maps what you see to what you can do. This is, so this is what we call a partial observable stochastic control problem. Now for such problems, suppose that we have uh, the following criteria, either the discount cost criterion or the average cost criterion. And uh, you may minimize uh, either of the, uh, this uh, performance criteria. 
And we call this a partially observable Markov decision processes because these are Markov decision processes where we do not see the state. That's why we call this partially observed or POMDPs. Now to solve such problems, uh, a, a very powerful technique is the following. So what you can do is, is you can try to focus on the state that you don't know. So you compute the conditional probability measure of the state given what is available to us. So anyway, this is the information that you have as the decision maker. You have the past measurements and the past actions, and you compute the conditional probability on the, on the state given what is available to you. And we call this the filter process, the controlled filter or the conditional uh, probability measure process. And note that this filter process takes values from the space of probability measures. Okay. Now we can show that this filter process itself is a Markov process. But the Markov, uh, Markovian process now, instead of living, instead of taking values in X, it takes values in the set of probability measures on X. So in a way, even if X were finite, for example, P of X, the set of probability measures on X will always be uncountable. And you can obtain uh, the explicit characterization of this kernel as follows. Suppose that uh, you have uh, the current conditional probability measure is Z, the most recent action is U, and the most recent measurement is Y, then you compute the conditional probability of the current state, or next state, given the most recent measurement, the current measurement, the most recent action, and the previous uh, uh, conditional probability measure, pre previous filter realization. And this defines, as I mentioned, uh, a conditional probability measure from the set of probability measures and actions to the set of um, probability measures. And eta is the kernel of this new uh, uncountable space value, uh, uh, what you call a, a probability measure value Markov uh, control Markov process. And furthermore, if you look at the cost function, the cost realization, if you apply what we call the iterated expectation or the smoothing, smoothing property of conditional expectation, which says that if you take the expectation of a random variable and take the expectation of the expectation, it's the same as taking the expectation of the inner random variable. Then you can express this cost function in terms of the filter process. And in particular, you define this expression as your new cost function. So with the, the above uh, 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 analysis, you conclude that even though I do not know the state value, I know what I believe what the state value is. So my belief is known to me, and my belief lives in the set of probability measures. I have the same action space, I have a new equivalent cost criterion, and I have a kernel, which is the conditional probability measure for the given belief value to the next belief value and given the current action. So this defines a fully observable Markov decision process, but now the dimension is much, much larger than the original space, than the original uh, uh, hidden uh, Markov decision process. And in particular, though, using the te techniques uh, or using the regularity properties I discussed earlier, you can conclude that an optimal solution, if there were to exist one, would have to be Markovian and would be using the current belief value as a sufficient statistic. In particular, we can state the following. So remember the discount cost of the equation, for example. Then you can conclude that if this equation has a solution, then the solution of this equation, J beta, will be the optimal value function. And this minimization will give us the optimal policy for every given uh, realization of the filter. But we also made the point that this requires some conditions. For example, we said that it can be weak failure, we can be setwise continuous, we can be Wasserstein continuous. We need those conditions to be able to conclude that an, opt an optimal solution exists and my value function is going to be sufficiently regular. Right? In particular, we require that eta is either weakly continuous or, or strongly continuous or Wasserstein continuous, right? Because those, those conditions are going to be uh, uh, required. Now, and this brings us to some re several recent results. So the first theorem is that under either of the conditions below, eta is weakly continuous, thereby implying that an optimal exists. And this condition, for example, one condition is a condition due to Feinberg, and also it builds on uh, an earlier result by Crisson and, and Doucet. And in this case, uh, if the transition kernel is weakly continuous and the observation channel is total variation continuous, for example, as I uh, gave examples earlier, you, you might remember, uh, and because this will be recorded, hopefully uh, future attendees can follow these uh, conditions more explicitly by uh, looking at the references, studying the references. Or if the transition probability is total variation continuous, with no assumptions on the measurement kernel Q, then we conclude that eta is weakly continuous, and therefore we can conclude that an optimal policy, uh, an optimal solution exists, and also the optimal value function
Resident very soon. And I want to note that Cepa's continuity is too strong for uh, such a uh, brief uh, MDP uh, reduction of partial observable models. This is a result due to Feinberg and, and collaborators. And, and also, uh, we can also obtain conditions for Wasserstein regularity. For example, uh, we can obtain some conditions where, again, my, my, uh, my strategy for discussing this is to just give you the flavor of the ideas. So for a graduate student in mathematics, I want to, in a way, present what types of ideas are, are, are uh, are followed in uh, problems of this type, and uh, just to give you a flavor of the uh, the, the uh, ingredients that one needs to study to be able to study problems of this type. And a, a, a recent result uh, uh, is that under the conditions I mentioned, uh, then we obtain also Wasserstein regularity. Okay. So in particular, under the conditions given here, action space is compact, my transition kernel is solvation continuous, and there's a uniformity in the uh, total variation regularity of the kernel. And, uh, the, and if the cost function is uniformly Lipschitz in U, then uh, we conclude that uh, our kernel is Wasserstein continuous, and in particular, an optimal solution exists uh, for the discount cost problem. And furthermore, if beta is 1 and k2 k is less than 1, then an optimal solution also exists for the average cost problem. Now, why is, uh, why is this regularity problem uh, important? And the reason is the following. So even though we can talk about existence uh, of an optimal solution, we, in the end, will have to compute it. In particular, in the current uh, panorama of research uh, and uh, uh, the very complex environments that one needs learning, uh, learnability and the application of learning theoretic algorithms for such problems. And for a rigorous understanding, it's very important to give guarantees for optimality or guarantees for near optimality. And for this, it's very important to understand on the conditions for which we can obtain rigorous approximation and rigorous uh, convergence uh, uh, results for uh, partial observed models as well as more complex models. In particular, if we have a, a, a problem uh, of the type I mentioned, because the state space is now the set of probability measures, which is an uncountable state space, we have to be able to obtain uh, numerical methods and learning methods. Therefore, we have to give a rigorous approximation methods, and the weak uh, regularity gives us the first or the weakest condition under which one can apply uh, rigorous approximation uh, algorithms. Okay. However, before I present this general theory on how to approximate and how to apply learning ideas, uh, as I noted here, my, the discussion will be incomplete. So I, I, I added, in fact, this discussion very recently. Uh, shortly before our seminar, our analysis will be incomplete without studying a very important special case. And this is the case of uh, linear systems. So many of you have heard the name Kalman filter, but maybe you haven't really studied the, the uh, corresponding, uh, corresponding context in the overall panorama of partial observable models. So suppose we have a linear system and we have uh, linear measurements. And suppose that X0, WT, and VT are all Gaussian random variables. Now for a Gaussian random variable, as we all know, hopefully as we all may have seen somewhere, what you only need is the mean and the covariance. If you know the mean and the covariance of a Gaussian random variable, you know the entire distribution of the Gaussian of the random variable. So you cannot say this for any arbitrary uh, probability measure. A probability measure uh, cannot be characterized by only one or two functions. In fact, you need countably many functions in general to be able to identify or distinguish probability measures from one another. But when you are Gaussian, you only need to know the mean and the covariance matrix. And that's the main idea behind the Kalman filter. Because the conditional probability measure for a Gaussian system will always be uh, Gaussian, no matter what you have seen up until a, a, a given time. Therefore, the, all you have to do is track the conditional mean and the conditional covariance matrix given by these two expressions. And the Kalman filter gives you the equations for basically tracking the mean and the covariance. And basically, this is what it means to be the uh, the Kalman filter update equations. And you can show that under some control theoretic terms known as observability, which in a way gives you a measure of the quality of the measurements. Basically, it's a rank condition which maps x0 to your measurements. Or controllability condition, in this case, it's a property of controllability, which means that you want to be able to map, if you take the u term out and map uh, focus on wt and pretend that wt is your control, it's basically an irreducibility condition from wt to the uh, reachable space of your X process, then uh, you can show that this conditional covariance matrix will converge to a unique limit regardless of where you start from. 
In a way, it also gives you what you call a robustness property. It doesn't matter where you start from when you run your common filtering update equation. And for the linear model, if you try to minimize the following cost function, for the cost function, then it turns out that you can solve this equation by applying uh, backwards induction, as I discussed earlier, and optimal control policy is going to be linear, and it's going to have this uh, uh, algebraic form. And we call this uh, the, the, uh, the linear uh, optimal control problem, which satisfies a very important property called the, as the uh, separation property. And these PTs are recursively computed using the Riccati equation. So maybe this might inspire you to uh, do some research uh, on the internet on, uh, on the Riccati equation. Now, after this brief, uh, 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 brief excursion, let's go back to our original problem, uh, where we discussed the general nonlinear case. Now, to be able to study approximation methods, we have to give a general uh, approach, a general program on how we are approaching this problem. Let's suppose that we have a kernel tau, we have cost function c, and we have a policy gamma. And suppose that this induces the following cost function. So this is the expectation of the discounted horizon, infinite horizon, discounted cost criterion. I take the expectation of the cost function. And again, my policy is gamma, my kernel is tau, and my prior is p. And suppose I want to minimize this over all possible policies. I, I call this minimization j star beta of c and tau. The first question you ask is the following. Suppose that I have a sequence of kernels tau n, and say tau n goes to tau. And say cn is a sequence of cost functions, and cn goes to c. Is it the case that the optimal values will also converge? So when is it that, for example, my value function is, in a sense, robust to my modeling errors in my kernel as well as in my cost function. And even more importantly, suppose that I have the true model is given by tau, tau and c, but I'm designing a policy for an approximate model. And my optimal policy for the approximate model is gamma n star, but, but I apply it to the true model. So anyway, anyway let me just repeat. So, so tau is the true model, and tau n is my approximate model, or the assumed model. I solve my problem for the assumed model. I obtain the optimal solution gamma n, and I apply gamma n to the true model. And is it the case that as tau n goes to tau, the cost of mismatch, or the robustness cost, does it go to zero? It's a very important problem. Of course, uh, robustness is a, is a very important attribute for all types of uh, engineering uh, problems uh, and also problems where stochastic control can be applied. And there are several th results behind this, both classical and recent. And uh, the only thing I want to highlight is that uh, in the work with uh, Naji Saldi and Tamas Schindler, we, uh, we worked on the case where we only require weak continuity. Basically, we don't require stronger notions. And this weak continuity is very, very important, very powerful. And you cannot really make this uh, condition uh, uh, weaker when you are applying the theory to partial variable models. And this is the motivation for the discussion here. Then having given that general uh, background discussion, the idea is the following. So we will apply two different techniques. In one technique, we'll be quantizing the set of probability measures, obtaining a finite approximate model, solve the finite model, apply the results to the original model, and show that the cost of mismatch, or the approximation cost, goes to zero as we increase the granularity of our finite approximations. In, in this case, what you do is you have your space of probability measures, you uh, partition it, and then you partition it in such a way that you represent each bin with a given element in the set of probability measures, and you define an approximate cost function, an approximate kernel. So this will give us a finite approximation. But now everything is finite valued. And then you obtain uh, under the conditions given here, which are the conditions on uh, Lipschitz regularity of the value function, which I uh, discussed earlier with explicit conditions for which, for when this will hold, then you can show that the value function is upper bounded by this error, where L bar is the maximal error or the diameter of your approximation uh, sets or your quantization bins. Okay. Again, I just want to give the, the flavor of the ideas. Uh, I, 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 I'm sorry for uh, this busy slide, but I just want to give the, the, the types of arguments, and, and you can study the papers where, for uh, the explicit analysis. Okay. Now, uh, maybe a more natural and also mathematically, I think, very rich uh, approach is the following. Instead of quantizing special probability measures, what if I only focus on my history of the information, and I truncate my history, and I only focus on a sliding window of the past history? So to motivate this discussion, I want to talk about what we call the, the filter stability problem. 
Now, once again, let's define the conditional probability measure uh, as the filter process and the conditional predictor process, which is the conditional probability measure of the future state given the previous information. Now, suppose that the prior is mu and I have an observer, which is where the observer is thinking that the prior is not mu, but the prior is new. In fact, this is something which is very practical. Uh, for example, let's say, suppose that we live in, uh, in an environment where uh, there is a, a process and the process is a true dynamics, but we have an incorrect, we have an, let's say, a biased opinion about the dynamics. For example, let's say there's global warming. Uh, suppose, suppose that in reality there's, there's global warming. And suppose that you don't believe in global warming, so you have a different prior, but you see data, you see data, you see data, and you ask the question, is it the case that as I collect more and more data, does data overrule the incorrect prior? So we call this the filter of the problem. And when you talk about correction, you have to specify what you mean by correction, in what sense. And for this, you talk about different criteria. You say, for example, my filter process is stable in, weak, in the weak sense. If this expression goes to zero, so in a way, this is the conditional expectation of every continuous bounded function given the past information. So in this case, this is a true conditional probability measure. This is the conditional probability measure when you start with the incorrect initialization. Or you can say that I want this to be in total variation. You can say that I want this to be almost surely. You can say that I want this to be true for every policy. Or you can say that I want this to be true in a geometrically fast fashion. So you know you can have a, a hierarchy of uh, uh, stability criteria for when data overrules an incorrect prior. And then once you obtain conditions then, and for example, you can give sufficient conditions for uh, this type of problems uh, to be applicable, you apply this idea of uh, correcting an incorrect initialization with increasing data to obtain near optimal control policies where you only focus on your finite window of information. Let me give the, the, uh, the essence of the idea. So the idea is the following. So suppose that in general, you have access to the entire past, but instead of the entire past, you only hold on to your most recent window of measurements, basically the most recent n measurements and the most recent n actions. And you ask the question, if I only focus on the, this data, is there a performance loss? Or can I bound my performance loss? And in particular, as I increase my window length, do I obtain a near optimal policy where the error goes to zero and then goes to infinity? We can also give a race of convergence, which relate the error in performance with the length of the window size. So in particular, let me give the, the uh, pictorial description of the idea. So remember, at the very beginning of the presentation, I talk about the admissible policies. In this case, you have the entire past. So all the history up to time t and all the actions up to time t minus 1, and you map them to your action. We made the observation that, well, we can in fact show that without any loss, I can summarize this whole past with the conditional probability measure or the filter value. And I can use the filter value mapped to you. The filter value is probability measure valued, but nonetheless, we have lots of structural results now. We can apply the ideas uh, that we have obtained to obtain a near optimal policy. But instead of this now, uh, and this is an argument of my former student, uh, Ali Kara, instead of holding to the entire past, what if we hold on to a past of the uh, state at time t minus n, and what happens afterwards? And you can show that, in fact, this is optimal. This we uh, holding on to the the belief at time t minus n, and what happens after time n is optimal. And then you can quantize this by viewing this as, as a product space valued variable where pi is endowed with the v-convenience topology, and these are endowed with the product of topology. And you quantize pi t minus n to a fixed state, and then you hold on to the most recent n window values. Therefore, you can completely eliminate the probability measure valued here. You only focus on the finite window. And in this case now, you use the property of the big continuity of the kernel. And then it's going to give you a fi approximate finite window MDP. And then you can show that basically this finite window MDP, uh, and with the details given here, but the, my discuss discussion, I think, gave you the essence of the idea. You can obtain an approximate cost value. You can obtain an approximate kernel. And using the Vic feather property that we discussed earlier, you can obtain uh, the optimal function that the finite window MDP satisfies. And using the value function, you obtain the following theorem. Let me just give you the theorem. The theorem is the following. The loss that you obtain by applying the finite window corresponding to the original cost problem is upper bound by this expression, where this LTN is this expression here. 
LTN is in a way you take the maximum of all possible pulses and you look at the difference between the error when your initialization is, is pi t t minus versus the initialization is a fixed value pi, pi hat and you look at the window size of uh, size n and if this term goes to zero then you can guarantee that your loss due to applying a finite window pulse is, is, is going to be diminishing geometrically fast. And you can obtain basic conditions. And furthermore, you can obtain some conditions, sufficient conditions for it. For, this. for example, recently we obtained uh, some relaxations of this condition. And, uh, and in fact, it's a very active area of research uh, because it has many implications in, in applications beyond partial observable models. In mean field models, for example, or multi agent models. And I, I, maybe I should also note that often in the theory of partial observable models, most of the results uh, are often experimental and uh, results of the, this type are, are fairly recent yeah, in the literature. And, but there are still many interesting, many open problems for problems of this type. Okay. Now, so far I talk about approximations and I talked about uh, regularity and approximations. But even though we, we have approximation bounds, we still have to solve a problem for the approximate model. And the question is, how can we obtain an optimal solution for the approximate model? In particular, can we apply learning? Again, I want this to be viewed as part of the tutorial type discussion. Now, learning is a, a very important problem. It's an emerging problem. Nowadays, as you know, machine learning uh, is everywhere. In every area, uh, one looks for uh, trying to obtain solutions uh, often by getting by without knowing what we are uh, dealing with. And, and of course, it's a very uh, delicate, very uh, carefully uh, uh, stated the, the approach, because what you learn may not be consequential, or what you learn may not be optimal in any way. And it's very important to understand the conditions or limitations of learning theory. And this discussion here hopefully will give some insight as to the types of conditions that one should be after to verify that what you learn is in fact uh, optimal or near optimal. Now, in many problems, uh, we don't really know what we are dealing with. And even if uh, even when we know what we are dealing with, the problem may be too difficult or too complex to be able to implement or to analyze. So, and in some problems, for example, uh, we may not even know the type of problems that we are dealing with. For example, we don't, may not know that we are dealing with an MDP or a PMDP or th that we are dealing with a multi-agent system. For example, let's think of a, think of a, a a doctor who is trying to treat a patient. A patient comes to the doctor and the doctor looks at the uh, some... So, so, uh, so in this case, uh, learning theory is, is very important because learning theory allows us to use data to be able to come up with uh, optimal or near-optimal policies. So in particular, uh, for fully observable models, uh, the uh, a very important uh, learning algorithm known as the Q-learning algorithm is the following dynamics. So, so QK is your what you call Q function, which uh, is a, in a sense, a, a performance measure of the state and action pairs. And what you do is you update this value, Q value, for it every every realization. If your policy does better, your cost function goes down. If your policy does worse, your cost function goes up. And you can show that if uh, the values for which you are updating the new incoming knowledge, which we call the learning rate, if the learning rate is not summable, but square summable, then this QK process will converge to a Q star almost surely as time goes to infinity. And the limit Q satisfies a fixed point equation. And this fixed point equation is in fact the optimality equation that you obtain from the discount cost uh, optimality analysis. In fact, this equation is the reason why the Q-learning algorithm is so, so important and so powerful. However, the Q-learning algorithm as presented is only applicable for finite state values, finite state, finite action uh, 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 MDP models. And in particular, you cannot apply them to continuous spaces. Now, how can we apply learning for partial observable models? So in this case, uh, a first attempt will be to try to apply the Q-learning as if we observe the state uh, and the state is the measurement itself. In this case, you can apply the same theory, same, same algorithms. You can show that your Q-learning algorithm converges, but what it converges to may or may not be consequential. And what you can show is the following. Under some conditions, 
I'll just quickly go through the theorem. You can show that your Q learning algorithm will converge. It, it, it converges to a fixed point equation. And this fixed point equation is going to be the equation which we discussed earlier using the finite window approximation. And in particular, if you have fitter stability, then you can pretend that your finite window is your state. You can run your Q learning algorithm as if the finite window is the actual state. And that is going to give you a rigorously uh, justified convergence and also near optimality. Okay. So, so in, in this case, there are some refinements of this. And I, I, maybe I'll just quickly skip this discussion in the interest of time. And finally, uh, I also want to say that so the, I, I can skip. The same theory also applies for the average cost case. For the average cost case, uh, you may remember that we have this average cost of small equation. So you can show that under the Wasserstein regularity I discussed earlier, in the recent result by um, uh, our student uh, Emre Demirji and uh, Ali Kara. So you can show that if your contraction is less than one, then uh, a solution to the average cost of total equation exists. And furthermore, the solution can be obtained by solving a discounted cost equation and taking the discount parameter to one. To one. And in particular, an implication of this is that when you have an incorrect prior for an average cost problem, when you solve the problem for the incorrect prior applied to the true model, then your cost of mismatch is going to be zero when the average cost of small equation applies. And furthermore, you can also show that you can also show that uh, the value of the uh, discounted cost optimal equation as beta goes to one approaches to the uh, value of the average cost problem. And uh, two implications of this is the following: one is that you can apply near optimality uh, of results for discounted cost problems, and also you can apply the learning theoretic results. And finally, I also want to dis uh, discuss uh, very briefly uh, the continuous time version of this. So for many applications, one studies uh, processes evolving in, co in continuous time. In this case, the typical model is given the following. So you have dx is equal to bx dt plus sigma x db. So db uh, is what you call the, the, uh, the increments of the Brownian motion, which is the limit of uh, normalized random walks. And you have a measurement process given by uh, another noisy perturbation of the uh, hidden model G. You can show that to study this problem, you can obtain a piecewise constant, piecewise uh, uh, constant control policy, which allows for a time discretized version of this model given in this discrete time dynamics. So if you solve this problem as h goes to zero, the solution of this applied to the troop model is going to be near optimal. Therefore, all the discussions we've discussed so far is going to be applicable for uh, consistent models also. But in the interest of time, uh, I won't be able to discuss this. And finally, uh, so as, as I mentioned, my philosophy for this uh, style of the presentation was the following. The first 15, 20 minutes, I want to give a high level discussion of what uh, this, uh, the theory of stochastic control uh, entails uh, with some application areas, some concrete examples, some structural properties for the fully observable case. And then towards the end, I try to become a bit more specialized but the main goal will be to try to show you what types of mathematics and what types of applications uh, beyond the basic uh, uh, the description uh, one needs to study uh, for those of you who are interested in problems of this type. So in summary, I discussed partial observable stochastic control problems as a very mathematically interesting and mathematically very uh, rich and fertile uh, model, but also which is very practically important, practically relevant. And I talked about the, the uh, belief MDP reduction. Uh, this was the reduction where you, even though you don't know the state, you know what you believe the state is. You know your conditional probability measure on the state. You know your belief on the state. And this belief MDP uh, is an equivalent characterization of the problem, but the equivalent characterization requires an infinite dimensional open uh, state space. And you have to apply regularity or approximation results. For this, this we have to apply weak Feller continuity, strong continuity, or Wasserstein continuity conditions, which we have reported in, in the discussion. And then we can talk about approximations. And then so we can talk about approximations both either quantizing the space of probability measures or by using finite window of uh, information available to us. And we obtain rigorous bounds on both approximations as well as on uh, reinforcement learning for such problems. And then we applied uh, the same ideas for the average cost setup. So I, I apologize for the very fast last 10 minutes uh, and I conclude the seminar. Thank you, John.